there was and some discussion you... of mulayam singh becoming prime minister at one point of time but for lalu it was his fate that he was only seen as a rustic politician and i think that is a very inadequate description of lalu prasad here is someone who actually breaks into the lieutenant's delhi modi modi claims to be doing that for the first time but it's actually lalu prasad who did it in the 1990s i am usually interested in understanding as to what went into the making of a scholar and therefore i thought i should start uh, this conversation with you by uh, taking you back in your time in your biographical time a very awkward moment when one has to sort of look back and speak autobiographically uh, particularly for me because uh, i have not really been very self conscious in uh, thinking about these issues so i don't know how i would answer your question but very honestly uh, many of the things must have happened uh, purely by accident in the sense that uh, mm. uh, i didn't have this sort of dream uh, to be a scholar or to be uh, uh, a political scientist for that matter i studied political science mm. mainly because i felt at that young age uh, that i was interested in the subject and as you can imagine mm. uh, 40 years ago there was less consciousness about uh, career options and what would you do with this subject or that subject so i just liked it and opted for it and then uh, started studying for my post graduation i guess uh, it must be a, probably at the time of doing my post graduation that at least this consciousness that mm. there is such a discipline that you have to sort mm. of uh, go deeper into it if you really want to do something uh, must have arisen somewhere uh, i studied here itself in pune Hmm. and uh, in the sense i am a very parochial person in the sense that i studied in pune uh, i hmm. worked in pune though initially i worked in a college and then joined the university but i think there were teachers in the department at that time uh, who were not probably hmm. who might not even be known out to the outside world as great persons uh, except perhaps professor ram bapat uh who generally people still know about or what persuaded you to uh, start looking at electoral politics with this seriousness well i think that was my initial interest in fact even as a young school going uh, student i thought i was interested in this entire thing called power politics elections uh in a very juvenile way of course but uh, that interest then uh, became a little more systematic when i studied my masters and subsequently as mm. one started witnessing the actual elections and the things that were happening around uh, particularly since mm. let's say late 80s uh, and as you can imagine late 80s was a very critical moment for uh, political science as well as for indian politics so it was that time mm. i guess that i started looking at elections as something even more serious that is to say where you have to actually study and find out why and the how of elections uh, 1989 if mm. you sort of want to pin down to an year mm. and then and uh, yeah and as a teacher uh, of political science i'm sure you must have had some of those self critical moments as to what one was doing uh, in the name of political science yes of course what kind of issues that you encountered as a teacher of political science you know uh, when i started teaching uh, mm. there was this influence of uh, american uh, behavioral political science right right in a way i sort of integrated also later on in my work mm. but uh, the courses that we used to teach at that time and even studied at that time were more or less copied and uh, that somehow was a jarring moment that mm. while you enjoyed doing something new because it was a new political science in mm. fact the courses would be known as new political science modern political analysis and things like that mm. but at the same time the moment you started looking at ideas such as violence because mm. that was one of the new things that came 
uh, one realizes that the comparisons that we were doing that time were meaningless because they were after all still comparisons excluding most of the world right. uh, we in india didn't figure anywhere mm. and uh, even the foreign teachers or visiting scholars who would come to pune that time talking to them and asking them questions you sounded foolish because mm. uh, they would think that asking questions about india was uh, foolish mm. i mean they didn't say it. they used to be polite being americans after all but uh, mm. with american being american there comes a kind of confidence and arrogance which in a sense communicates to you that you are a child asking wrong questions ask me something about america ask me something about big issues uh, and then you would have europeans uh, asking uh, us or expecting us to ask questions about theory rather right. than and of course theory meaning ideas and western ideas history and so on rather than asking questions about why don't you study gandhi i mean this mm. question uh, would have mm. always been brushed aside as to why you don't think gandhi is serious mm. uh, and the person i mentioned earlier ram bapat was one uh, who would always tell us how important marx was and mm. then informally hold a series of uh, lectures uh, mm. talking to us about the gandhian tradition oh Hmm. So, which means uh, bringing together yeah. the Indian, uh, yeah, bringing together those two strands. And in fact, he was influenced by a Marathi intellectual uh, hmm. whose name is Acharya Zawdekar. Uh, okay. I had the later on, I had the fortune of uh, editing the selected writings of that person, Acharya Zawdekar. He died in 1955. He was a typical Gandhian. Hmm. but uh, his entire life business if you ask me what he was doing mm. he was trying to tell gandhians to take marx seriously okay. and he was telling the marxists to take <laughs> gandhi seriously and oh, yeah. I, as a result of that ni- neither of these two groups really upheld him mm. uh, intellectually so mm. uh, uh, that was a kind of subterranean interest i mm. took it up later on in the 90s mm. studied a part of zawdekar Uh, mm-hmm. did an edited volume of his selected writings mm-hmm. and then one of my research students actually did a phd for her research work on acharya zawdekar uh, thinking about what is satyagraha and how it is related to socialism or samajwad as he would call it mm-hmm. so that was so that's the wrong thing yes yeah so that's the marker probably i have heard from some uh, some of the other scholars from your generation that's the marker one uh, gets to see in the journey of uh, political science in india itself as to what kind of studies of politics in the context of south asia could be and how it could bring together materials from uh, that side of the world as well as from this side of the world yes but don't forget that that was also the time when talking of all these things was mm-hmm. actually equally stupid uh, in delhi circles Uh, right. because delhi then in political science uh, there was a kind of a division you were either a political scientist in the marxist sense of the term mm. or in the american sense of the term <laughs> and uh, i think the parochialism that i mentioned earlier saved me from both these traps and allowed me to sort of uh, chart out whatever i thought uh, i could do well uh, with another very senior colleague and teacher of mine Uh, when i and he both were very young we edited a marathi encyclopedic dictionary of political science right. uh, it is called rajya shastra kosh uh, mm-hmm. but it was not just a dictionary for each mm-hmm. marathi term we also wrote in 200 or 500 words its meaning and relevance but anyway the point mm-hmm. is that in the introduction to that book or dictionary we actually made this point that that uh, being a metropolitan intellectual brings you many advantages but it also entraps you into many things in that context i also wanted to hear from you the way you uh, stumbled upon the idea of uh, putting together marx and sorry um, uh, gandhi and ambedkar just like marx and gandhi uh, so furthermore gandhi and ambedkar 
and the suggestion that uh, they are supposed to be read together to understand modern India rather than read against each other. No. That happened in the 90s uh, because as you can imagine in the 90s there was a larger interest in Ambedkar suddenly. Uh, in a sense we all intellectuals in India uh, reinvented or started reinventing Ambedkar only mm. in the centenary year so to say mm. in the 1990s. 91 onwards, uh, but at least better late than never. So we started all of us doing that. And uh, the syncretism that we talk about in religious context was mm -hmm. also, I guess, uh, the hallmark of what Zabrekar, the person whom I mentioned earlier, uh, was characteristic of. Mm -hmm. uh, then that was also the time in Marathi circles, Marathi intellectual circles elsewhere also that uh, these two names just couldn't be uh, pronounced together. They were yes. seen so antithetical that mm. if you are talking of Gandhi, then you must be anti-Ambedkar. Mm. And of course, if you talked of Ambedkar, Gandhians were also equally disinterested in it because mm. they thought that Ambedkar was someone who denigrated Gandhi. Mm. Uh, and I thought that we needed to go beyond these for a very different reason. And that reason again is that I have never been interested in ideas as such, ideas per se. Uh, in the Indian context, I thought that these ideas have a traction when they relate to actual politics, actual political positions. Right. And therefore, then I started trying to look at these two things as to these two political forces uh, departing from each other and these two political ideologies or ideas and ways of looking at. Uh, also not talking to each other. Hmm. Uh, so I wrote a small piece in the EPW uh, early 1990s. They published it, uh, hmm. which was quite uh, critically seen. Nobody really much liked it uh, compared to today. Uh, hmm. 25 years ago, there was even much more animosity between the two camps, uh, right. both among uh, good intellectuals and also among practicing political leaders. Uh, mm. But uh, I stuck to that. I think that that needed to be revisited. I did it later on again, because in enthusiasm of 1995, uh, I had made some overstatements. I think that yes, there were differences between the two. And we need to understand those differences and need not fight their battles today, because right. they were political leaders. Obviously, they were adversaries, I would say. And as adversaries, they were thinking of chessboard tactics against each other. <laughs> Nevertheless, they also had this capacity of going beyond that because they had also a certain thinking in their mind. Right. They were not just cynical politicians. Exactly. So the, the way uh, today's uh, identity politics will influence even intellectual engagement with Ambedkar. Yes. That would uh, amount to cynical readings, uh, either in favor of Ambedkar or in favor of someone else. Yes. That would right. keep happening. So, but, but I can tell you, at least I can share this good news that uh, there is a very mm. senior Ambedkarite scholar in Mar Maharashtra mm. uh, who has consistently written mostly in Marathi. Uh, a very highly respected uh, intellectual, Rao Saheb Kasbe. Okay. Uh, when he was young, uh, he wrote a blasphemous book in one sense of the term, because the book argued that Marx and Ambedkar had much in common. Uh, right. That was in 1980s. And that was precisely the point on which the Dalit Panthers had actually uh, split with each other. Uh, Kasbe mm. himself was never part of the Panthers movement as such, but an intellectual mm. teacher of political science. So this same person, Rausef Kasbe, has only recently come out and unfortunately I can only report this because I haven't got the copy of the book, but he has written a big fat book exactly on this topic of Gandhi and Ambedkar saying why mm. Ambedkarite struggle today requires Gandhi. Uh, oh, that, yeah. is, that, is, that is what I have read from uh, the initial discussions and interviews that he has given. Mm. And I knew this personally because at least for last 10 years, he has been thinking on these lines. 
so he has taken a long time mm. to systematically write on this mm. so from the way political scientists or scholars in india would engage with the gandhi and ambedkar let's come to the way politics of our time engages with these uh, thinkers of modern india mm -hmm. uh, one would say that probably bjp is doing the best because it handles both with equal ease or so it seems i mean it can it, it can play with the gandhian model and it can play with the uh, iconography of ambedkar at once yes perhaps i might modify your statement by saying that yes the bjp seems to be the most capable of uh, uh, of of neutralizing both uh gandhi and <laughs> and once you have neutralized them uh, as symbols you can then adapt and integrate them into your politics very easily uh, so very that true. is what they have been doing uh, ambedkar in the case of ambedkar they started doing it much much earlier in fact uh, 1990 around 1990 a, a little earlier uh, so uh, with ambedkar they had realized that there is a mm. social force behind the name of ambedkar and therefore you have to win that social force without letting them be ambedkarites uh, right as for gandhi uh, they were still in two minds i guess they are still in two minds even today as to what to do with gandhi because gandhi does not have a political force behind him so it doesn't matter even if they sort of just set aside gandhi didn't say anything and that is why they have the temerity many of them have the temerity even today to celebrate gorse instead of gandhi because gandhi exactly. is someone behind whom there is no social force existing today as a result mm -hmm. of which you can forget about gandhi at one level though symbolically also as you were mentioning identity politics gandhi coming having come from gujarat and gandhi also being still veneer by a large number of people uh, they need to use gandhi uh, and right. use his name uh, but if you look carefully at their discourse you will find that they are not integrating practically anything of either of these two uh, thinkers and politicians mm -hmm. but minus uh, uh, right wing politics and it's a uh, uh, it's the uh, act of neutralizing uh, the critical thinkers of modern india uh, minus that uh, where did you see ambedkarite politics headed with all its uh, uh, nature and scope where was it headed was it really successful in uh, uh, in in emphasizing the uh, interest of uh, downtrodden dalit uh, marginalized i think there are a couple of moments when i think the ambedkarite politics actually succeeded or at least made a point uh, and i am talking mostly of the post ambedkar period uh, so the first point at which this happened was as i mentioned earlier the formation of the dalit panthers uh, right again as a political movement it dissipated so very quickly but it made very important points and in a sense enriched uh, and took forward the ambedkarite legacy of critical thinking because above all what ambedkar was telling was this that look at society critically look at religion critically and then intervene in that now panthers did all these things they looked at society critically the hindu society they looked mm. at religion critically and they also tried to intervene with their argument that party politics is useless and we need to enter into the american panther type activism of self assertion because that self assertion alone will not only help the dalits or the oppressed community as such that is to say the so called ex untouchable community but it's a question of larger emancipation so panthers movement is important not because it did something for the dalits alone but it redrew our attention to the fact that it's a larger question of emancipation both philosophically and politically mm -hmm. so i think that was a moment of success
Uh, and though they were only in Maharashtra, you will now find that in Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, the importance and memory of Panthers is quite alive. Mm. And that is why I am mentioning uh, Panthers. Mm. The second and probably very different moment of success is the Kanshiram moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes. I know that many Ambedkarites, blue blooded or true blooded Ambedkarites, Okay. would be very uncomfortable with Kanshira. Mm. I am not at all comfortable with his politics, mm. particularly his understanding of power and caste. Mm. But nevertheless, he actually draws out a political energy from among the Dalit community and right. shows that you can leverage it. Mm. Uh, of course, time played in his favor because Kanshira's politics emerges after or around the fall of the Congress. And therefore, that is the time when even a smaller political energy can be leveraged for such things. Hmm. He did it very well, but he, not, he didn't just do it. He gave this idea to the Dalit community that you can intervene in competitive politics. Hmm. Unfortunately, he was not interested in questions of religion, religious reform, or mm. religious philosophy and therefore Buddhism. Mm. So that didn't combine. But at the same time, I think this was an important moment. And by Kanshira moment, I am including in it the early Mayavati moment as well. So mm. I'm not excluding her from that. Politically, it extends to even her efforts to not only intervene in UP politics, but also to do something very dramatic. And that something dramatic is to grab power in UP on her own. Uh, it is a courageous politics to argue for a Dalit politician uh, groomed in the Kanshiram tradition to say that we Dalits will do politics of the Sarva Samaj. If you right. recall, she yeah. started talking of Sarva Samaj. And that Sarva Samaj moment, again, is very interesting, like the Panthers that it is not just power for Dalits, but the power for ordinary people. She didn't say this. Of course, her politics didn't allow her to theorize. And I don't think she is interested in theorizing, even ideologizing these things. Right. But sometimes politicians have this native wisdom of throwing up a new politics. Uh -huh. uh, and then it is for us to read that politics. Hmm. I don't know whether India was ready for that. We missed that moment. But otherwise, from Kanshiram to Mayavati was the other successful moment hmm. uh, in this entire post Ambedkarite period. Hmm. Then from there, one can go to Bihar, where a lot of things started happening in the name of social justice. Yes. Then it became yet another mainstream model of politics in Bihar. Absolutely. 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 Bihar has been in a cauldron like India. Uh, but even more than that, uh, since the times of the JP movement. Exactly. And therefore, in a sense, all this goes back to JP. And JP movement, again, is to say, I mean, it's a label. Because, again, J. Prakash Narayan was a label at the time when the movement actually was happening. And therefore, one actually has to go farther and backward to remember Luhia and right. Karpuri Thakur. Hmm. Karpuri Thakur particularly because Karpuri hmm. Thakur was chief minister of Bihar hmm. and it was during his time that Bihar in a sense uh, got on the boil as a result of which the Mandal Commission had to be appointed. The second backward classes commission comes mainly because what was happening in Bihar. Hmm. So in many senses, yes, Bihar is important and that importance of Bihar Reiter gets reiterated when Lalu Prasad emerges in 1990. So that was the Lalu moment. So again, one has always to remember that we might caricature Lalu, we might like or dislike him, we might feel jubilant that he is in jail because of corruption, anything. But historically, and as students of social processes, we must remember that Lalu happens in the Bihar of a particular context, of a particular background. And then he seizes that moment. Hmm. That decade was Lalu's moment, a decade. 
the decade of the 90s from 1989 90 onwards exactly as i said the other day uh, in this indian express uh, interaction uh, i think the importance of lalu prasad is underplayed we think that he did something to bihar you know his supporters would say that he brought the backwards to the uh, forefront his uh, detractors would say that he brought jangal raj but all this is only within the context of bihar i look at lalu prasad as the first politician coming from not just in caste terms but otherwise coming from an ordinary background non dynastic non political context and then get crashing in delhi and this get crashing by lalu prasad yeah. is historically not fully appreciated uh, lalu prasad moment was certainly a very important moment and it reaffirmed that idea of an alternative model of politics uh, might emerge that kind of sense probably many of the scholars who were observing they had but did it really emerge is there really an alternative model which is in sight today yeah that's that's actually the other part of the story that while lalu prasad as an individual breaks a threshold uh, politics always mm -hmm. has severe limitations and one of the limitations of lalu prasad's politics was that he probably never imagined redefining or broadening the idea of social justice he used the idea of social justice but he doesn't broaden it up and therefore we got stuck up his politics as a model of politics never really flourished that lalu prasad's politics never had this ambition of actually broadening the scope of the actual content of politics and therefore social justice unfortunately remains only as a label or at best a reservation platform uh, we uh, social scientists and many of the social scientists at that time were pro mandal pro social justice uh, just as there was in the 1960s a division between marxist and non marxist political scientists or social scientists uh, 1990s in social sciences there was a division between those in favor of social justice and those against social justice looking back today i think both sides were exaggerating their own positions unnecessarily okay. uh, for the simple reason that reservations cannot be equivalent to social justice it has to be something more than that reservation has a limited role to play and therefore today to quickly sort of push you to mm. uh, the present moment 30 years ahead when you find that people complain against yadav domination in bihar and rjd being a yadav party or when in uh, neighboring uh, states you find the jats demanding reservations and neighboring states patels right. demanding reservations and in my own state here marathas demanding reservations then you realize that this was going to happen because we reduced the idea of social justice to reservations number one and secondly even for the policy of reservation we did not have enough gatekeeping mechanisms as a result of which anyone who could get crash could get reservations lingayats could get reservations and so on and so forth so the others are demanding reservations i am surprised why therefore we as students of social sciences are still not asking for a fresh look and please underline this not at reservations as such but a fresh look at the entire question of backwardness a moment has arrived when we need to have a third backward classes commission a commission which would look at the definition of backwardness a commission which would look at the questions of how to understand backwardness and how to remedy it in this time and year 1990 when it started and originally 1980 when it was recommended is a very long time ago the economic paradigm has changed the urban rural relations have changed 
and even agrarian relations internally have changed and it is in this context that we need to have a real look at the question of backwardness the arjun sengupta commission came close to it but naturally it was not its sort of brief they were not asked to do that the upa mm. wanted to do the equal opportunities commission but cynically they wanted to do it mostly for muslims if these ideas right. could have been combined the insights mm. of the arjun sengupta commission about the unorganized sector and therefore questions of poverty on the one hand and the insights of the equal opportunities commission if they could be combined something different could have happened and we can still do it if political parties start thinking seriously about a third backward classes commission mm. unfortunately we in social sciences who pride in giving advice to the government never do these things because they are not likely to be popular governments mm. are not likely to listen to us so we right. don't want to do that but i think it is the responsibility of this present generation of social scientists to critically look at this entire cauldron called social justice and its outcome and then look at backwardness because backwardness has not gone so the bottom line remains that backwardness has not gone the bottom line also remains that caste and backwardness remain closely interlinked and yet the problem remains that mm -hmm. you can't handle that caste based backwardness only by selecting castes and giving them reservations exactly that is the trap we are now facing mm. so pandemic is the time to uh, probably uh, ask some of these kind of fundamental questions and in that spirit i also had a, a, a curiosity which is very close to my heart and that is that the electoral politics is very performative in nature today yes uh, with the and that is why importance of facebook twitter whatsapp uh, it doesn't look like any political party in the party politics system would be averse to any of these platforms they play very significant role so uh, do you think political scientists also need to shift their gears and make sense of the intricate details of the performative politics rather than just electoral politics as a conventional model you know in fact political parties are very very alert to this performative aspect of politics mm. uh, in fact even before social media electoral politics and competitive politics has always had a very strong performative element it did uh, theatrical element performative element and that is quite natural because electoral politics and democratic politics at one level is finally about the relationship between the leader and the people however much you dislike it these two categories emerge in democratic politics democratic politics however democratic you make it finally looks upon a leader and therefore it is not just today it is from the famous mythical uh, athenian times that right. you have this performative element mm -hmm. in the idea of demos because the demos is always looking at somebody's performance it is always looking up to somebody and as electoral politics matures gets more complex uh, the leaders also learn this technique of decoupling performance in the sense of actual democratic governance performance and performance as personal performance and appearance hmm. they make this distinction and therefore you find that Uh, i think there is a famous story i may be wrong but at least there is a story that even at the time of tendering his resignation on the television nixon was advised which coat and tie he should be wearing <laughs> uh, supposing this story is not correct supposing i am wrong even then i think the moral of the story is this that politicians are always very self conscious about this performative aspect uh, and it comes naturally to them i don't see anything wrong in that 
Therefore, coming to your questions, the performance that now we are talking about is probably even more artificially manufactured performance. Mm. That is where the difference lies. Mm. Uh, Ram Guha, in mm. his book on Indian politics, yeah. uh, actually quotes this long passage written by A.D. Goravala or someone about Nehru's speech and how yeah. Nehru would simply stand uh, silent for a minute and that would attract the people and excite them. Right. But at the same time, Nehru or later on his daughter's uh, arch rival Charan Singh mm. or Jagjivan Ram for that matter had to say something. They had something to say. They wanted to say something. I or you may not agree or agree with them. Mm. But Charan Singh after all was a politician who might be doing some performance, but he was doing at the same time something that he wanted to do. Today's politics, because of social media and for various other reasons, is in a sense becoming vacuous in this sense, that yeah. politicians actually don't have to tell me anything. And that is why I look at the parrots who are sitting on their arms and the jackets that they wear. Hmm. Right, right. You're right. In a way, I mean, there are not too many important questions which are discussed in electoral politics anymore. It right. seems there are other things more important than real questions. That's right. And that is deception. Mm -hmm. So that, that de performative politics is deceptive politics. And the mm -hmm. same applies to social media. One, in the first place, because you can create an army of people who work in social media on your behalf. Mm. And secondly, social media is problematic also because then you start setting the agenda. We always keep hearing this term that something has become viral. Right. Now, you make things viral, <laughs> things don't become viral in themselves. <laughs> that is where the limit of democratic politics comes in. So, mm. as I said about the leadership factor, you know, mm. leadership is so important for democracy because otherwise, as Weber once said, democracy mm. would be a very drab, routine, uninteresting affair. Yeah. And in a sense, right. democracy does require this shock that there would be a leader, a popular leader who would stir you and me out of our comfort zones and we will start looking at this question as to what people are thinking. Yes. But when leaders stop leading, leaders stop initiating any subjects, leaders, when they stop even giving you any policy ideas, then they are no different from actors and actresses who just act in front of a camera. They are not emoting they are simply showing emotions. And that is what right. our politics currently becomes. And by our, I am not critiquing only Indian politics. That is happening everywhere. All over the world. Yeah, yes. so democratic politics actually is facing this crisis everywhere. And in that regard, we find that ruling party and opposition, they rival against one another in staking their claim of supremacy in the same in performative domain, electoral In politics. the same performative domain, rather than saying something different or wanting to say something different. And that is where we have actually very, very honestly and fully imitated American politics. Hmm. In right. this particular sense, that there is just then no difference. Uh, though, mm -hmm. although um, among Republicans and Democrats, finally, finally, there are at least supposed to be some differences. Supposed to be. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't know in India whether that would happen or not. Uh, even today, I would still dare to say that mm -hmm. between BJP and Congress, there would still supposed to be some differences. Congress right. was complicit in many riots. Mm -hmm. BJP did instigate many riots. But the purpose behind the riots that the Congress did and the plan behind the riots that the BJP allegedly instigated are two different things. One is a political project, the other is only cynical politics. And right. cynical politics any day is less dangerous to democracy than 
planned politics which wants to use democracy to undermine democracy that's really wonderful observation i really appreciate this i would now come to from the party politics uh, electoral politics in india and elsewhere i'll come to uh, come back to that intellectual politics from where we started our conversation so as far as i um, know and correct me if i am wrong you had strong brush at marxism at some point of time and 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 in that with that uh, brush uh, first thing whether you hold that brush is still in your hand and secondly how much does it help uh, today does it really help it's difficult to answer because uh, i don't know uh, marxists don't treat me as uh, a marxist okay <laughs> but yes there would be some writings uh, or lectures that i might have given where there is a kind of uh, over over tinge of marxism and uh, i wouldn't be very apologetic about that even today because i think that as an analytical tool uh, marxism gives me as a student of social sciences something very enriching hmm. uh, the idea for example that one has to look at state uh, as a repressive agency uh, is something that we need to take very seriously and one of the jokes that i always keep sharing with one of my non marxist friend and a politician today is precisely this that when we and other marxists were saying that the indian state is the executive arm of the capitalist the indian state was far more autonomous right <laughs> today when we have given up marxism as an analytical tool the indian state seems to be much more an arm of the uh, capitalist class executive agency of the capitalist class mm. and even more so a repressive agency right and these insights that marx gives mm. so if your question is whether i look upon marxism as solution and mm. an ideology mm. i would be very guarded in saying whether i believe it in believe in it or not i think marxism gives you an analytical prism mm. from that analytical prism it is the brilliance of our politics that we need to find where to go and therefore mm. marx as is famously said of marx himself marx never tells you where to go and how to go these are all ideas that later came through the debates between trotsky and lenin and so on and so forth so in that fundamental sense i would say that there is much for us as students of social sciences to learn from marx mm -hmm. but if you ask me if you are a marxist social scientist right. i would not try to embarrass my marxist colleagues <laughs> by saying yes <laughs> no that's wonderful i mean it seems uh, uh, as long as uh, the typical uh, card holding marxists don't recognize you as a marxist and yet you you practice with the marxist prism in your analysis yeah, yeah i think i would put it this other way perhaps though you didn't ask it that way hmm. uh, you know the fundamental and this is not just because of the present political moment in india but hmm. increasingly as i started looking at both marxism and marxist analysis of the state then studying electoral politics and hmm. then having a more critical analysis of indian politics mm -hmm. through all these three stages gradually intellectually i think i have veered around the question of looking variously at the idea and practice of democracy mm -hmm. and if marxism is relevant to the understanding definition and critique of democracy i don't mind clinging to marxism for that purpose right because right. my present my present and by present i am saying long term interest is actually in this in uh, in 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 uh, around 2000s when this marxist influence perhaps could have been more visible i concluded one of my essays by saying that however marxist one could be and the analysis that i did was quite marxian mm -hmm. i said that the real challenge before us is to actually not think of revolution but to guard the moment of liberalism because that is the moment which will probably help us later on think of revolution 
and unfortunately 20 years down the line we have arrived at a point where leave aside thinking of revolution we can't even think of democracy today right and that is that is why my concern is less in the question whether i am a marxist and you are a marxist and she is a marxist and so on yeah. Yeah. and the question is whether we share a certain imagination which has a common democratic concern right yeah that makes sense actually instead of operating with those labels are should not be relevant but unfortunately in the intelligentsia for intelligentsia uh, those levels are somehow important oh, yes i understand that and one is to pay the price for <laughs> not upholding any one particular label just as one has to pay the price for equally since you come from the sociology background you would know it better uh, not upholding necessarily only one methodological label either exactly exactly <laughs> yeah in spite of all the fashionable talks about interdisciplinarity and all <laughs> these disciplinary boundaries are so strict yes that uh, i fully uh, thank you for empathizing <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what keeps you this is toward the end of the conversation i usually ask everyone because it's also my personal anxiety as to how one keeps uh, uh, active uh, oneself active during this kind of very taxing time which generates a lot of existential anxieties about about everything about our our personal existence as well as everything around us we have seen do do your respondents always give uh, serious answers to this question no they give very because my flippant answer to begin with would be circumstances keep you active right uh, in india unfortunately mm. the way politics unfolded since last 6 7 years uh, has ensured that any political scientist worth the label of political scientist would keep herself or him himself uh, intellectually and probably even actively very busy mm. would have to keep herself or himself very busy so uh, it's not just a flippant answer but unfortunately that is how it has happened so but yes otherwise the question is tough because our in institutional structures are such mm -hmm. that in the sense you have to distance from institutions at a given point of time right and once you have distance from institutions you also start getting distance from what is happening in the academia right because institutions are the node around which much of our academic things happen mm. for me however and now that is the personal serious answer that i am giving uh, during that last part of my academic career i had already started also simultaneously veering to a very weird indian term called public intellectual uh, oh. i wouldn't call myself one mm. uh, forgive me i wouldn't call myself one because public intellectual is far too serious a role mm. i wouldn't arrogate that role to myself but i think we also need in a country like india and probably in every country mm. a set of interlocutors right interlocutors who talk to two different universes one right. universe is the universe of pure academics mm. the so called what they call it you sit in glass houses etc etc armchair uh, i will retire i will retire yeah uh, so there is a universe of ivory towers where you play with ideas you write technical papers you mm. publish in uh, professional journals then you get awards and so you get invitations for foreign visits that is one universe the other universe is a universe of public discourse mm. which is raw which is rough and i'm not saying this in a pejorative sense it is bound to be so right right and with mediatization of our public life it's not just about politics mm -hmm. our entire public life has become mediatized okay. so uh, i look at the forward that is coming on my cell and then start how to tweet <laughs> now this mentality has also to be in a sense coped up with so the interlocutor role that i was talking about is somewhere there mm -hmm. that you try to translate some pure ideas into impure languages you try to talk not just to your peers in the academia mm. but also to those who had 
at least a dream of talking to those peers right so i'm not talking to the person on the road obviously i am not competent to doing that a politician is the most competent person to talk to common people as such right. so i wouldn't say i talk to common people but there are people who would try to relate to these two universes hmm. and we need interlocutors perhaps that idea keeps me going even today when i don't publish in academic journals or when i don't visit foreign universities and still i have this let us say awareness that something is happening there mm. like for example this question of uh, you might have heard it uh, democratic recession right. or something right. of that kind mm. uh, larry diamond used the term early uh, but i thought that while using that term i should only use it as a handle rather than using larry diamond's term mm. because for me and for much of the world the meaning of that is different from what larry has in the case of united states because his universe although after being so much globalized as an intellectual and i am not demeaning larry diamond his universe remains north america right. or the north of the atlantic hmm. and comparativism in the sense teaches us this that comparisons have to come from most of the world that is outside of north of the atlantic and if right. we have to do that then you need to look at what is happening in pakistan much more seriously than just mm. enjoying what is happening in pakistan you much more you need to much more empathize with colleagues and people of sri lanka than you criticize modi in india because what is yeah. happening in sri lanka is probably even more diabolically dangerous to democracy yeah, yeah, yeah. there mm. and that is comparison and that comparison if i don't tell my friends here in india then they would keep thinking only about india so mm -hmm. that particularism or exceptionalism can also be tackled with now these are various ways of mm -hmm. keeping oneself engaged it's a very fulfilling conversation uh, i had a uh, great pleasure talking to you i enjoyed the discussion and so long as both of us have enjoyed it i don't mind if people don't enjoy it much <laughs> one one hopes uh, mm -hmm. that people will enjoy and maybe draw something from uh, this conversation